you can call this lecture in your notes, say, Mexican politics of the, of the Republic period, Mexican Republic period. What we're going to pick up and talk about today is Mexican politics from essentially the years 1821 roughly until about 1835-36 at the outbreak of the Texas Revolution. The thing to understand about Mexican politics in, this, in, in Mexico's post-revolutionary period, uh, essentially 1821 going forward, is, is that uh, there's just some basic and big themes that should come out to you, and, and so, some of which you'll say, okay, it, this is somewhat analogous to the United States. In other ways, you'll say, no, it's not analogous to the United States. Uh, and that's one of the, the pitfalls when I give this lecture to students, and I've seen it even with some of the questions that I posted on the uh, exam and such, is, is that sometimes you'll see students uh, try to make the analogy of the United States to Mexico or some other nation, and it sometimes works and then it sometimes doesn't. But when we talk about Mexico in this post-revolutionary period, you're going to be dealing with some major factors and major underlying issues uh, that will affect Texas, of course, uh, because Texas is a far-flung uh, part of the Mexican Federal Republic. All right. First thing you need to remember, too, is, is that uh, when it comes to... Uh, oh, come on now. Give me a second. There it is. Okay. Now, when it comes to Mexican politics, uh, one thing to always remember about Texas and the Mexican Federal Union much like it was with the Spanish before the uh, Mexican Federal Union, uh, is, is that Texas is a far-flung part. It is an outpost in Mexico, the, just like in the United States in a sense. It's more, more analogous, more especially to, say, England or France, whereas London is the center. It's not just the political center of England, which, of course, it is, but London is also the financial center of Great Britain or England. So, and the United Kingdom, all the same thing as far as we're concerned. Paris is the central hub of society for the French nation. Uh, in a sense, if Paris falls, all of France falls. Uh, the same would probably be true for London in many respects. If, all, if London falls, all of uh, uh, England falls. It may not be quite so true with the United States, especially in the 1830s where we are in this class because in the United States in the 1830s, the United States is far more uh, rural than, say, those two other nations I just uh, shot out to you. And on top of that, Washington, D.C. in the 1830s was a tiny nation, a tiny state, excuse me, gosh, I'll get it right here, a tiny city compared to, say, New York or Philadelphia. Uh, Washington was clearly not the financial capital of the United States in the 1830s, whereas Paris and London certainly are. Uh, but anyways, Mexico City is my point, is Mexico City is the hub by which everything else revolves around in Mexican politics, even though it's a federal republic. And the far, far flung out part of that federal union is Texas. Uh, it would be analogous uh, to think about, I want you to think about how Texas is, is in relation to Mexico and Mexico City, particularly in the 1820s, is I want you to think of, say, uh, Washington, D.C. or New York City compared to North Dakota. Uh, many of you, I'm assuming all of you, have not been to North Dakota. If there's been one person who's been to North Dakota, you can always type it in, say, and put your hand up proudly. I've been to North Dakota, and I'm proud of it. If I had to guess, it was either because your dad was in the military uh, or mom was in the military because there's some Air Force bases there, or if you've been to North Dakota, it has to do with the fact that there was a bunch of oil play in the western part, which is called the Bakken Shell. Anyways, all that to say, though, is, uh, is, is that North Dakota is just an outpost. Even the Texans, who, uh, of course, we are a, a large state in the U.S., uh, United States here in 2021, the thing is, is that, uh, but even if you read some of the uh, reports that you see about Texas in regards to, at the time of this recording, uh, Texas in regards to the great uh, winter storm of 2021, you see some of the New York uh, uh, commentators acting like Texas has still got the Alamo and horses and so on. Uh, but even North Dakota further still. So my point is this, it's, it's, it's out there. It's, it's a frontera, to use uh, Don Frazier's term, and it's a common term. It's the frontier. That's where all the, the, the wild men live. That's where all the, uh, basically, the people who uh, can't hack it in more polite society, they move out to Texas. And so Texas, that's one of the first major themes, is that Texas is really left alone to our own devices uh, in this uh, federal republic era. 
and it's in this case it's somewhat analogous to the American Revolution, whereas in the American Revolution you talk about what's called a, a salutary neglect or benign neglect. Uh, we'll leave you alone just as long as you don't screw up too much and don't cause us too much problem or cost us too much money. Uh, we're just not going to pay that much attention to the American colonies. And Texas is kind of the same way. Uh, Texas, to go a little further too, probably I didn't write this in your notes, uh, is uh, Texas is going to be a part of uh, another state. It's so small, it has so few people in 1821, Texas's population is no more than 5,000 in 1821. Texas is going to be attached in the Constitution of 1824 in Mexico. It, Texas is, uh, the state of Texas is attached to a larger state called Coahuila. Coahuila. See, uh, uh, let me just type that in for you. C O A. Let me get my cursor over here. All right. C O A I L A. There you go. Typed in the chat bar. C O A H U I L A. Coahuila. And if you see, look at the Texas or Coahuila e Texas legislature in the Mexican Federal Union, Texas is uh, outvoted all the time by Coahuila just simply on account of arithmetic. So uh, Texas is small. It's a backwater. It's uh, primitive. It's very rural, very frontier. Uh, there's not many people living in it. And that's part of the reason why, as I've already lectured on with regard to the impresarios, uh, the Mexicans, and even before them, the Spanish are looking to get people to live in Texas to develop that far-flung part. And so that was that's part of the reason why you get the Anglo settlers that Stephen Austin brings in and Green DeWitt brings in. You get the uh, uh, the the Catholic uh, Hispanic settlers that is going to be Martin de Leon's colony. And then, of course, the Irish Catholic settlers that are not Mexican citizens initially who moved to Texas and the Irish colonies in south and coastal Texas. But uh, here's some more national themes beyond the Texas question uh, regarding, uh, you know, the Mexican Federal Union from 1821 to 1835-36 uh, when we had the revolution of te in Texas break out. Is, is that you're going to see Mexico struggle with a handful of major, major issues. Uh, Mexico City will struggle politically with some major issues. Number one is going to be the Catholic Church. Uh, as you may re remember, from the Plan de Iguala, that, for, that simple, very formal plan that ended the uh, Mexican Revolution as the agreement between the Criollos, which, were the, uh, which are uh, the uh, Mexican-born pure-blooded Spaniards, and the Peninsulares, who own most of the land, have the highest titles and nobility, but are also Spanish-born overseers in the sense of Mexico. That Plan de Iguala is going to settle that the Mexican Revolution in three basic ways. One of which, of course, is that Mexico will be a Catholic nation. Uh, so you probably ought to write this down, is this, that Mexico is going to struggle with Catholicism and struggle with the concept of religious freedom. Uh, they don't, they don't practice it. The idea that Mexico needed to have religious freedom uh, was a scary and a potentially revolutionary and a ripping as aspect of society. Uh, there were many Mexican leaders, uh, some who were very faithful Catholics and others who were more uh, lax or less observant in the Catholicism, who basically said that the Catholic Church and Catholicism is something that Mexico must have because it, it, it creates a social cohesion to the nation and keeps the people bound together properly. That won't always be the case because you'll see it working differently than what they'd expected. But number one, the Plan de Iguala is going to be uh, Mexico is a, is a Catholic nation. Another problem Mexico is going to deal with in this time period it has to deal with the issue of politics. Uh, a lot of it has to do, and you can write this under the general heading of Mexican politics as the statement here, Mexican politics is unstable. It is unstable as current jelly. And as we go through this, I'm going to ask you to look up this and to look up that. And I'm going to try to pull up the uh, uh, Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia page to make my point. But Mexican politics is extremely unstable, meaning that you don't have a cohesiveness. You don't have this uh, regular, uh, the regular but uh, basically calendar-like churn of the political season, meaning that, okay, we're going to have an election every two years. We're going to have a presidential election every four years. But you, within that churn, it's a normal churn. It's a normality that you expect and are used to. Mexico doesn't have it. Mexico is unstable for several reasons, one of which, some of which we've already touched on. 
uh, in previous lectures <clears throat> and now, the, the first one being that Peninsularis Criollos uh, tension that I've already mentioned. Uh, just because they sign a peace treaty in 1821 does not mean that Mexico is, uh, you know, everything is great and, you know, uh, champagne and oysters for everybody and unicorns uh, prance and, and run up and down the streets. That's not the case. There's a lot of, a lot of bad blood, a lot of envy, envy and jealousy between the Criollos and the Peninsulares, and so they still are going to butt heads. Secondly, another problem in Mexico in this time period is this issue of the army. Please write that in your notes. The army is going to cause, cause Mexico to be very unstable. And uh, if you think an army can't uh, cause uh, problems for a new republic, you need to read more history. This is one of the reasons we study history is we learn where our ancestors made mistakes and we perhaps try to avoid some of the same mistakes. So anyways, the Mexicans, uh, their army is large, and I'll talk more about that as we go, but the Mexican army is, a, is an impediment uh, to a stable Mexico, and I'll explain why as we go. And number three, back to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is going to be problematic as well, uh, and it's going to be problematic because, again, this is uh, this 1820s, 1830s period of time uh, is post-revolutionary, not just for Mexico, but post-revolutionary for the United States, which is a which is a neighbor, of course, and potentially a a, a leading light, or potentially some sort of a beacon. I say beacon, like a guide to how to navigate a post-revolutionary society. But even more so than that, arguably, is is that you're going to see the French Revolution in its afterglow, which is a, a much more consuming revolution than the American Revolution ever was is what do you do about religion? And what role more particularly does the church, now again, back to the Catholic church, what role does the Catholic church have to play in politics? Now, we are used to in the United States, and I will assume most, if not all of you are citizens or permanent residents of the United States. But my point is this, is that you're used to, or you should be familiar with the term, uh, the separation of church and state. Now, as some of you might be quick to point out, that that term is not in the U.S. Constitution, and that is true. That is a phrase from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, in the uh, early founding period, in the, <clears throat> the early republic period of American history. But you do get this, even if it's not specifically said, you do get the very clear drift from the Constitution that uh, the United States government and uh, later on the states themselves should take a general hands-off approach to the religion uh, in the sense that uh, they, they, the, there's, a, there's separated spheres. There is the sphere for religion, meaning what you do on Sunday or other days of the week, uh, depending on your faith or, or simply if you have no uh, belief in an afterlife of God or whatever, well, that, that's fine too. The United States takes a hands-off approach, generally speaking. Uh, hands-off in the state, it's not going to have an official state church, and on top of that, they're not going to interfere with your ability to um, worship as you see fit. Mexico, by virtue of being a, and we're, again, we're still in Mexico City, not so much Texas, the frontier of Texas uh, is a little bit of a different animal because it's just so far flung and the Mexicans cannot enforce these policies uh, very well. But Mexico is a Catholic nation and a Catholic state. However, one of the, the aspects that you don't get nearly as much in the United States, or at least not officially in the United States, you, you get preachers here and preachers there talking and, and politicking. But in Mexico, you're going to see the Catholic Church playing a lot of uh, politics. They're going to be very active in the Mexican political situation. We'll talk more about that as we go. But anyways, uh, Mexico is just simply politically unstable, and it's unstable for a lot of different reasons, and that will have profound impact upon Texas and Mexico, and uh, especially for Mexico, it's not for the better. It is not going to be uh, well served by it. So, uh, again, as we uh, pick up and we think about Mexico in this Federal Republic era, we ought to keep in mind some basic uh, concepts uh, and uh, understandings. As I've said to you before, and I will repeat again, the, uh, the top of the food chain, the highest, as it were, caste of Mexican society are going to be your Peninsulares and your uh, Criollos, the Blancos, the, the whites, as it were. Uh, it's uh, basically a reference to their pure Spanish bloodlines, and they make up approximately 18% of the population. 
And as we've said before in class, the Indios or the Native American Indians of Mexico, they will make up approximately 60% of the population in this, uh, these, uh, this decade of the 1820s. And this mestizo mixed uh, race is going to be about 22% of the population. So 18% for the, uh, uh, the pure-blooded Spaniards, 22% for the mestizo mixed, and the Indians make up the rest at about 60%. So we have that set up right there. And I think it's also worth noting, you're going to have, and it's Don Frazier makes a really good point about this, is that Mexico has, and it goes before Mexico to Spain, has all these different stratas and different settings of, of uh, your, your race or your, your, your station in Mexican society, uh, different groups. What is your bloodline? You'll have mulattoes in this group and that group. It gets rather intricate beyond what we need to get into. But to look at Mexico, I, I think uh, particularly here as we look around Mexico City and the environment, environments around the capital, uh, several things to keep in mind as we go into this 1820s time period is, is that for the most part, you see Mexico having fairly small families, Mexicans having fairly small families. And by the way, when we say small families, my definition of a small family is probably about the same as your definition. When you say small family, you think maybe one or two kids. Uh, what we're talking about here is three and four children would be a small family. We're not talking six and eight. So uh, that's a small family. Is, it's a little bit different definition back in that era. So three and four kids versus one and two uh, for us today. Uh, but you will see large families, uh, particularly amongst the aristocratic types. Uh, you'll see these large families uh, take hold in the time period uh, that you find in the Peninsulares and also in your Criollos. Also, it's worth noting, too, is, is that uh, you're going to see large families, but you also should be noting, too, that there's a high infant mortality rate. There is a high, high infant mortality rate in some parts of Mexico, 50% in other places higher than that. Now, when you say, what is infant mortality? What is a high infant mortality rate? And excuse me, what does that mean? What is infant mortality? It means the baby dies within the first year of its life. And so they basically does not make it to the year one, does not make it to her, his or her first birthday. Uh, but in, in a sense, that is common, not just for Mexico, but also in the United States. I, I don't want to just seem like I'm picking on Mexico because you'll have high infant mortality rates in the United States. It's not unheard of. But you do have uh, large families uh, in certain aspects. Excuse me. Obviously, these will be tr especially amongst the observant and even those who are uh, maybe not quite as observant in the Catholicism, but uh, but uh, ceremonially observant. Uh, they you will have uh, Catholic marriages. Uh, they will be married by uh, the church, but you'll also have a legal component too. Uh, when we talk about marriage uh, for the girl, it's somewhere around the age of eighteen. For the man, it's about twenty-one. Uh, that's not a big split like you'll see in, say, Cavalier, Virginia, uh, but you'll see uh, a little bit of a difference between the age of a man getting married at age 21 and a woman at age 18. Uh, but as we go into what makes Mexico a little bit different than the United States, this next part is going to be rather important because it impacts Texas. Uh, you can, I can le lecture on this more, and I don't think I will just because of uh, time constraints at the end of this eight weeks uh, and as this course draws to a close. But the thing is, is that uh, one of the things that uh, sometimes is trotted out is, is that, uh, the, uh, that Texas was, uh, uh, was uh, legally speaking hard on women. But if you know the legal uh, background of the, of the state of Texas, even today, the, the state of Texas draws some of its heritage, its legal heritage, not just from the United States, but as you'd expect from Spain and from Mexico. And how this works out for women, it's uh, quite uh, important. And it gets to the point of property ownership. And uh, I believe Don Frazier mentions this uh, in one of his videos. Uh, but the thing is, is that property ownership is uh, is appropriate and uh, quite legal in Mexico and by extension Texas for women. In fact, actually, I would write this down in your notes like this. A quarter, a quarter of all property in Mexico City was owned by a woman. A quarter of all property in Mexico City was uh, owned by a woman in 1830 to give you the year. So, uh, and that was unheard of in the United States. 
Uh, in Mexico, let's just say for argument's sake, me and uh, let's just say her name, a uh, woman, woman's name was Mary, and, and I'm single and she's a widower or whatever, uh, she's a widow, excuse me, and I marry her. Uh, in Mexico, whatever property and whatever possessions she brings to the marriage, that's hers. It is hers. It, it does not become joint. It does not become mine. Unlike, say, for example, New York State. Please use that as an example. That's American State as an example, New York. Also, probably ought to put this man's name in your notes. Uh, please uh, mention, let's see, what's his name? Oh, Aaron Burr. Now, if you've watched the movie Hamilton, if you have been to the play Hamilton, I guess that's probably the better way to say it, you know, Burr's the villain in the play because he shoots Hamilton. Aaron Burr was a scoundrel. There's no two ways about it. That man was a schemer and a dreamer. Uh, Jefferson referred to him as a crooked gun uh, that you never were sure which way he would shoot. But anyways, Burr, uh, after this is after he kills Hamilton in that famous duel, Burr goes off and marries this uh, younger woman. He was a, a charming devil. And uh, before this uh, young widow uh, realizes what's going on, Burr is basically draining her, her checking accounts. Uh, because in New York po uh, policy or New York state law in the 1810s, uh, it was quite legal for a husband uh, to basically spend the money as he saw fit. That was, uh, that was the way they did it in New York and many other American states, is, is that the man was the head of the household. Not true in Texas. So uh, in some respects, a woman, as soon as she immigrated to Texas from the United States, Mexican Texas from the United States, she gained more rights over her property and over her, uh, her possessions than she would have ever had in an American state. So in, in that sense, uh, uh, that's there. So, uh, but as you look at the, at the society, the older, the, the higher part of Mexican society during this federal period of the 1820s, uh, especially amongst the Blancas, uh, those who were of the elite class. You're going to see a lot of uh, affairs and adultery. You're going to see a lot of consternation and bickering and fighting. A lot of the homes were just not happy places. Uh, and especially in a time period before you get uh, quality birth control, what I mean by that is effective birth control, you're going to also see in Mexican society, especially amongst the elites, you're going to see more than a few women uh, who become pregnant because of these affairs. And so uh, that's, that's all there. Uh, but I will add one last uh, little note here. This would reflect the Catholic nature of Mexico. Uh, divorce was not, generally speaking, permitted in Mexico. Uh, it was legally permitted, but it was rare. Ma uh, divorce in the United States was rare, to be clear, too. But uh, as far as uh, if you know your Catholic teaching, and some of you grew up Catholic, so you certainly should know this, uh, divorce, or excuse me, marriage is a sacrament in the Catholic Church. It's not something you... Uh, uh, enter into lightly. Uh, it is a means by which the church confers the saving grace of Jesus, uh, amongst others. Uh, it, it is not something that is done away quickly. Uh, you, don't get you don't get divorced, at least uh, in the eyes of the church. You just simply don't. You may have an annulment, but not a divorce. But divorce uh, from a legal standpoint in Mexico happened. It was just uh, fairly uh, rare. And uh, as we work through uh, these elites, I, I think you also need to put this next part in your notes, is, is that uh, not only was there this familial friction between husband and wife uh, that's out there in the 1820s, uh, these elites also are going to have some problems with regard to debt. Please make note of that. They, they carry on a lot of debt. Uh, it's, it's actually, you'll see this sort of thing in South Carolina in the 1830s. But uh, these elites have a role to play in society. They know it. They, they, they have been born and bred into it for years and years. And as I'd like to say, you are what you were born to be when I talk about Mexico. You, if you're born an elite, you are an elite, and there's just no two ways about it. But that doesn't mean that because you're elite, that means you have a lot of money. Mexico was hurt a lot, and I talked a few minutes ago about the the problems Mexico had in the post uh, revolution. Give me the post revolutionary period. But one of the issues that probably needs to be said too is is that Mexico just did not have a lot of money. Mexico was not wealthy. It it is at times it is blessed by natural resources, but the effects of the revolution were profound upon Mexico. 
Uh, for examples, here are some examples for you to give you an idea how hard ne the Mexican Revolution was on Mexico. Uh, even if it didn't have climactic battle after climactic battle after climactic battle, Mexico is going to, you're going to see parts of Mexico that have ruined villages, ruined towns, not full blown cities, but ruined villages and towns that by 1830, 1835, meaning right on the doorstep of the Texas Revolution, have not been rebuilt. It, it, that, that says a lot when you don't rebuild a town that had been ruined or at least partially damaged by warfare. You don't rebuild it. There's something very wrong in a society, regardless of where you find it, that does not rebuild its towns. Uh, either it's, uh, it, there's something wrong, it just depends on what it is. So that's a, that's a symptom of, of Mexico's problems. They don't have much money to rebuild. Number two, uh, in the afterwash of the revolution, you'll find bodies unburied. I mean, you literally will see animals and men and women who will be killed by the revolution or die in the, during the revolution. They won't be buried and their bones will lay out in the sun for years and years. Uh, that's a spectacular. But as far as Mexico not having money, perhaps for me, the, the most uh, ex easy example uh, and the best one I can think of uh, when it comes to the Mexican problems here. Uh, with regard to money, let me see if I can find this. I have it written down somewhere. Where did you go? Anyways, when it comes to uh, oh, it, when it comes to marriage, it's about marriage actually. But it, when it comes to marriage uh, in Mexico, uh, it, obviously the state wants you to get married. But it, it suffice to say it like this: is is that without me finding the note and taking the time to pause and do it. Suffice to say, though, is, is that it costs more to get a formal legal marriage license, a marriage license like I got for my wife, Gloria, when I went down to the Burleson County Courthouse 14, almost 15 years ago to get married to her, or like some of you will do in the near future, some later, whatever. But you go to, to the, the courthouse in Texas to go get a marriage license and you pay 50, 100 bucks or whatever the, the amount is. All that to say, though, is, is that... Um, is, is that uh, it costs more to get a marriage license in Mexico than to buy a simple house in Mexico. It would be the equivalent of, say, your starter home in Texas costing $150,000, uh, and you ended up needing to spend $200,000 to get a marriage license. The, 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 that, that's the principle. Mexico had no money, and that's going to be one of the bigger problems it faces along with some of that other stuff. But... Uh, it's a couple of uh, minor issues I want to just dispose of quickly before I really launch into the problems Mexico faces in this, this area and get deep into uh, the problems of the Catholic Church, the problems with the army, the problems with the, the government. Um, one of the things you'll see talked about with the Texas Revolution and one of the, the causes for the revolution, and I've never been completely convinced by it, in fact, I'm kind of taking a dim view of that as a cause, is the issue of uh, shadow slavery. Uh, African slavery in Texas. Uh, one of the things that you should be aware of, I should have, would have been mentioned by me or Frazier or the textbook or whatever, is, is that uh, uh, shadow slavery, meaning the ability to own another man and to uh, wring his uh, brow for your money, basically uh, kind of trying to uh, echo Lincoln's uh, phraseology in his second inaugural, is, is that when the Anglos uh, came to Texas, uh, when they came to Texas in the 1820s, one of the conditions was essentially that we need to be able to bring our slaves. Now, Mexico by the eight, mid-1820s, about 1826 in fact, uh, Mexico is going to abolish slavery. Uh, and that will be brought up and said, well, Mexico was against slavery and so on. Uh, Mexico, it's worth noting, abolishes slavery without much Con, uh, comment without much, uh, you know, there was no war fought over slavery. There was uh, really no, uh, uh, there wasn't even much emancip uh, compensated emancipation uh, for slavery in Mexico. The reason I bring this up is, is that that is one of the issues that the issue of slavery is seemingly brought up in a modern sense about the Texas Revolution. Uh, I, as I said, I'm not particularly uh, a big sayer that that is what causes the revolution. I think there's many other issues. But I do want to add this too, though, is that Mexico, the reason Mexico got rid of slavery so easily uh, in the mid-1820s uh, 
to, in my estimation and my analysis of Mexico in the 1820s is, is that Mexico already had a labor system and that Patron system we've talked about that the peons and the patrons and whoever was there, that was your labor system. You didn't need chattel slavery. Now, obviously, those Anglo settlers who are coming to Austin's colony or coming to DeWitt's colony or some of the others uh, along Brazor in Brazoria County today, which of course would have been Austin anyways, they practiced slavery and they brought it with them. Now, do they call it slavery? Formally, no. They call it a, a form of indentured servitude, uh, but Mexico winked and nodded at it. The Americans winked and nodded at it. And everybody, or excuse me, the Americans immigrants winked and nodded at it. And it was just, that was the practice. Uh, but Mexico, yes, formally banned slavery, but they allowed it to work in practice uh, through indentured servitude. And honestly, I would say at times with the Patron system uh, that you see in Texas and elsewhere as well. So as we go forward now, let's talk about some of the major, major issues, those uh, big issues in Mexico. And I guess we could start with uh, the Catholic Church. We could start with that one. Uh, they're all big. I don't know which one's the biggest. I think they're all bad. Uh, none of them help Mexico out all that much as a nation. So uh, first things first, the, the, uh, in the afterwash of the, the uh, revolution of 18, 1810 to 1821, Mexico is going to... Uh, really have to figure out what type of Catholic nation it wants to be. And one of the things uh, that you'll see in Mexico in this post-revolutionary period is what do we do with our priests? What do we do with the bishops? One of the practices that Spain had and had wrung out of it and wiggled out of the Holy See in Rome, meaning the Church of Rome, the, the, the papacy there in Rome, was is that the... Uh, the Spanish crown over the years, over the centuries, in fact, in New Spain, had the essentially had the ability or the authority to appoint bishops in Mexico. You probably ought to write that down. And when we talk about this, and if you're not familiar with the ins and the outs of the Catholic Church, meaning the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, it's real simple for our purposes. At the top of the, uh, at the head of the church is the Pope, and underneath him are your bishops and cardinals and so on. And today's the Pope is Francis, and then you have a, a, a slew of bishops, cardinals, archbishops, and so on, who were the kind of the second tier for our simple uh, a set, a, a rain, arrangement of uh, papal succession. And then for the vast majority of individuals, say, if, you're, if you grew up Catholic, who you would have dealt with was going to be, in all honesty, was going to be the Catholic priest, your local parish priest. And so, just so we're clear, the Pope appoints bishops or I say appoints bishops, he ordains bishops, or bishops in turn ordain priests, and the priests deliver the sacraments. They perform the, the rites of the Catholic Church in the sacramental system. Prior to the Mexican Revolution, fill, the filling of offices, these filling of bishops' uh, offices or bishoprics, and the filling of the priestly offices was done by the crown, the, the Spanish crown. The Rome agreed to it. Rome, meaning the Church of Rome, the, the Pope said, okay, you can appoint for us. It was an agreement that goes back. But after the revolution, two things uh, manifest themselves. Number one is, is that the Catholic Church was not exactly excited about the development of <clears throat> new democracies and more particularly new republics in the world. Uh, the Catholic Church at times, especially in the 19th century, could be very, very resistant uh, to uh, changes in the form of democracy, republic ideas, and so forth, small r republic. So like in the United States uh, and so on. The thing is, too, is, is that and with that said, so at times Rome is going to withhold the appointment of bishops to Mexico and, to the, and priests to Mexico. Secondly, Secondly, Mexico is going to expect, this is the new nation of Mex Mexico, Mexico is going to expect the ability to appoint bishops and priests like the Kingdom of Spain had done before. And Rome says, hold on a second, boys. We don't think we're going to go down that path. We have problems with you being a republic, number one. Secondly, we want that power back. We think properly it should reside in in, uh, in Rome and not in Mexico City. So what? Well, here's the point though. You say, well, how does this work out? It's all church business. As I said at the outset and early on in this lecture, 
Rome is going to be playing politics. The church plays politics. The church is inter, uh, intertwined. The, the, all the lectures about uh, the Mission Presidio complex, that, that, that's a theme in the background, sometimes explicitly stated by me, is, is that they all work together. And Rome wants to appoint its own men. All, of course, all priests and all bishops are men. Wants to appoint their own men to the uh, to the various offices that are emptying in Mexico. What you end up having having in Mexico in the 1820s and into the early 1830s. Please mark this down. Is you're going to see Mexico. You're going to see Mexico suffer from a lack of priests and a lack of bishops. And again, you may think, why does that matter? What is that a big deal to? Well, from tw the perch of 2021, as we record this lecture, it may not seem like a big deal, especially if your view of the afterlife is there isn't one or it's, uh, it's, it's uh, all roads lead to heaven or something else. But in a devoutly, especially for the rank and the file and for the, uh, the lower class or the lower castes of Mexico, if your concept of religion is the Catholic Church is the true church and the Catholic Church is the way to heaven and you want to go to heaven because your life has been hard and you, you don't want to go to purgatory, excuse me, you don't want to go to hell. Hell's, if hell's a real place, you don't want to go there. Um, you got to remember you know, something about Catholic dogma and practices is that you get the, you get the saving grace of Jesus through the sacramental system, the, the, the mass, i.e. the Eucharist, uh, th is the holy orders, if you're a priest, uh, marriage, uh, confirmation, uh, baptism, and so on and so on. There's seven of them. All the saving grace of Jesus is conferred penance. I shouldn't forget that one. That's a big one at that time. But all the saving grace of Jesus is conferred through the, the sacramental system. Remember this too. This is the corollary to it. This makes this uh, wheel turn. That's fine. However, under Catholic dogma and practice, uh, you can send your way out. You can basically send your way out of heaven. You can, to change my terminology, you can lose your salvation. Uh, this is not Baptist Doctrine 101. Some of you grew up Baptist and said, no, 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 no. Uh, once saved, always saved. That, that's a particular type of Baptist uh, statement. Even um, maybe if you grew up Calvinistic, uh, that would be one way you'd say it too but not the Roman Catholic Church. Now, they would say you can send your way out of heaven. All right, here's the problem is, is that you need frequent reception of those sacraments, especially penance coming to mind, to maintain your status uh, on, in the good side with God, uh, the good, good graces of the church. If your local parish does not have, your local parish does not have a priest, well, then you can't get the sacraments, and it's the uh, you see how it starts to cause problems. You get to be worried. What if you have a child that was never baptized properly, or never baptized at all, and he dies in the first year of mar uh, of life, like so many of them did? Where did your child go? I mean, there there's a whole lot of uh, things that you would think about, and that tends to rip at the social fabric. Also worth noting, too, in Mexico in this time period, back amongst now we're talking the elites, when we talked about this ripping at the social fabric, that was a concern of the, of the lower caste. But of the Peninsularis Criollos caste, please put this in your notes, their worry would be that, uh, that the problem they had, uh, and one name that comes to mind real quickly is a guy named Lorenzo de Zavala. Probably ought to write his name down. Uh, so if you come from the San Antonio area, there's going to be what De Zavala uh, Avenue or De Zavala Road. Uh, and if you see Zavala in lots of places, uh, it's named for that Lorenzo De Zavala. Lorenzo De Zavala, who's nicknamed Lorenzo the Magnificent, was from the Yucatan. He's uh, really a dynamo in this time period. He, he'll end up being the first vice president of the Republic of Texas. Uh, but he was, uh, at times, you, you almost think, listen to him, you think he was anti-Catholic. Uh, he's a Freemason, which is, by the way, something we'll get to in, in a few minutes. But you think he was anti-Catholic, uh, but no, he wasn't. He was actually Catholic. But Zavala, like many other elites in Mexico would say, is that the Catholic Church lost its way. But more especially, the Spanish version of the Catholic Church, the Spanish version of the Catholic Church that had been practiced in Mexico for years. 
You see this in different forms of Christianity, whether it's the Catholic ver uh, type or other denominations like Baptist or Methodist or somewhere else. You'll see the Church of Christ comes to mind as well. The, the, the basic is, is that if we just go back to the formal, pristine past, then everything would have been will be fine. Go back to the primitive church, to use the term. As Zavala was that way. He was Catholic, but he just said all the stuff that had grown up around the Spanish version of the Catholic Church, that was superfluous. That was uh, ridiculous. Some of that, just no thank you. And so he'll have, he'll have uh, some headbutting uh, with the Catholic authorities on that account too. So, but all that to say, though, is, is that you're going to see the Catholic Church uh, have issue, uh, play a role in Mexican politics. At times, also add this in notes too, it seems like the Catholic Church is hoping and encouraging the return of Spain and Mexico. So that's a problem as well. And last but not least, this is actually really big, and I'm just going to give it a short shrift. I probably ought to spend more time talking on it, but it's, it is big. Is, is that when the Mexican government in the 1830s especially needs to borrow money to, well, in this case, to finance and to fight the revolution and the rebels in Texas, in 1835-36, the Mexican government will turn to the Catholic Church in Mexico and say, will you please loan us some money? And the Catholic Church says, of course we will. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot to mention this to you. The Mexican Catholic Church or the Catholic Church in Mexico controls about 50% uh, of the GDP in Mexico, 50% of the gross domestic product of Mexico. So that ought to tell you how influential they're going to be. If you're borrowing uh, princely sums of money to do X, Y, and Z, unless it's, uh, unless it's so much that it, the, the, the tiger is turned on you. But if you borrow money from somebody, normally you be, are beholding to, some, beholden to that person. And the Catholic Church will loan money to the government of Mexico, and they're neck deep in politics. They all knew each other. Some of them were even related. And so uh, that's, uh, that's a big issue right there. Number two. Let's talk about the army. Let's put uh, talk about the army for a moment or two. First things first, uh, as I keep saying, as I've started to say, is that Mexico does not have money coming out of its ears. It's frankly a poor nation in the post-revolutionary period. Yet Mexico is going to maintain a large standing army. Write that in your notes. They're going to maintain a large standing army. That was not the practice of the United States. In fact, the United States, in, her, in our history, especially in the early 19th century, the United States' uh, idea of an army was a small army uh, that had a handful of officers and a handful of men. Uh, basically, and you may think, well, why did the United States do that? And I'll come back to Mexico in a second to play off of the U.S. So if you're the United States, think about your geography. Uh, what is uh, to the east of the United States? Water and mountains. It's uninhabited. Nobody lives in the plains and so on. So you got the Pacific Ocean, you got the Rocky Mountains, and you got the, the, the Great Plains. Ain't nobody living there except for natives, and you don't care that much about them anyways at this point in time. There's nothing of value that you want from them, so you leave them alone. To the east, what do you look out? Uh, if you look out to the east from uh, Washington, D.C., you find the Atlantic Ocean, and that is, of course, a great barrier that keeps uh, invasion of the United States at bay from England. They may come, but they've got to cross an ocean to get here, and it gives you time. Next, if you look up to the north, you've got Canada, and I assume nobody on this, uh, on this, who are watching this video or this recording lay awake, lay awake at night worrying about the great Canadian hordes descending out of Quebec and attacking the United States. It, not, certainly not today, and even in 1830s, it wasn't a big deal. And to the south in the United States, especially in the 1830s, uh, or 1820s, I mean, it's, it's a whole lot of nothing. Uh, Mexico is just getting together. So the United States has a lot of open, uh, can have open borders and have a small army because the threat's not there. Secondly, the United States keeps a small army around philosophically, does not grow the army because they are worried, because uh, many of those early founders knew their history. They were worried that if you had a large army, that meant then you would also potentially invite a strongman general to uh, mobilize the army a la Caesar, or Cromwell, if you look in English history, and mobilize the army to attack the government and sack the government and replace it with themselves. So anyways, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that when we talk about, say it's just one o'clock, okay, making sure I got time. The fact of the matter is the United States philosophically and practically can get away with it. 
Mexico, on the other hand, doesn't have the same philosophical angle as much, but more practically, it, it, it has to keep a big army around. First of all, you may say, why do they need to keep a big army around? And if you know Mexican history, uh, you can answer the question already. In Mexico's history, who did Mexico tangle with in the first 70, heck, even the first 40 years of her, her existence? Let me think a second. Arguably, in the first 25 years of her existence. One, the United States and the war with Mex uh, the Mexican War from the American perspective, or the Mexican-American War, whatever you want to call it. The fact of the matter is, is that the Mexico has to keep a big army around because of the United States down the road. And more immediately, please put this in your notes, Spain. There was always the worry, and it was a justified worry in Mexico, that because Spain uh, had, ne had uh, never been fully uh, annihilated on the battlefield and had never fully accepted Mexican independence, that Spain would try to come back and reinvade Mexico and take it back. And in fact, that happens on several occasions, one that we'll deal with in this class in 1829. Uh, that is, uh, it, it's what helps propel uh, Antonio Lopez de Santana to become the El Presidente that we know of in Texas history. So you worry about it, you have to keep a big army around to defend the nation. So that's, that's the answer to the question. But you should know this, and if you don't, you're going to know it now. Armies aren't cheap. You don't just, uh, people don't just join the army out of the goodness of their heart and stay in the army for a career for no pay. They got to be paid something. And so you, to, to, to pay for the guns and for the uniforms and the bullets and all that sort of thing, uh, food, and supplies, it costs money, money that Mexico doesn't have. And add this into your notes too, the Mexican army, especially amongst the officers, are horribly corrupt. That's one of the major issues in the revolution against Texas or the rebellion in Texas and later in the war with the United States is that the Mexican army's corruptions uh, manifest themselves on the battlefield. I mean, if, if you think about it, I see Joseph's shining picture there in front of me. But if I want this, if Joseph was a Mexican soldado at the Alamo, or not the Alamo, but at Bejar in 1835, and Joseph uh, went to shoot me, and I'm a Texas rebel, I mean, he takes his musket, he levels his gun, snap, bang, and he, he hits me in the chest. He, first of all, he watched that bullet hit me in the chest like it was an old Daisy uh, Air BB gun. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then you probably shouldn't see a bullet fly in flight. More than a few Texans got hit in the chest. I used the Battle of Concepcion uh, in 1835. But more than a few Texians got shot in the chest or somewhere else, and the bullet didn't penetrate because the gunpowder was so bad. In the American uh, the war with the United States, Mex uh, Mexican cannoneers, who were really actually fairly good, were saddled with such bad gunpowder like their uh, infantrymen counterparts were that American soldiers, uh, in more than a few instances, literally saw the cannonballs rolling and just stepped out of the way like they just stepped out of the way of, uh, you know, a, a, a bowling ball going by harmlessly. Anyways. The, the classic example, and the one I want you to write down, is, is that the corruption in the Mexican army was horrible and you, it, in the form of kickbacks and payola and money and all that, in the form of uh, bad gunpowder. That's the classic example, and for our purposes, good enough. But the Mexican army, this is even more corrosive. Corruption is corrosive. Corruption is bad. I, I'll give you mon monetarily. Uh, dipping your hand into the till can cause some major issues. But corruption can take other forms, too. And in the corruption of the Mexican army is really a political corruption, and that's even far more corrosive. Uh, that is really the, an acid to a, uh, this foundation of a young republic. The Mexican army played politics. Oh, my gosh, they were politically active, especially the officers. The men, they're just sitting along for the ride. But the officers uh, are very politically active. If we were in class together at this point in time, I'd probably ask you to take out a $20 bill or a $50 bill or a $1 bill and ask you to look at it. And you know who's on the one, and that's uh, President uh, Washington. And if you look at who's on the one, what's he wearing? He's wearing civilian attire appropriate for the time period. If you look at the $20 bill before it gets changed to Harriet Tubman, if you look at the $20 bill, it's going to be Andrew Jackson. Jackson made his name as a hero of the United States, a hero of the of Battle of New Orleans, one of his nicknames. Uh, many of the men who fight in the Texian re uh, Revolution or the Texas Revolution will have made their name fighting alongside Jackson. 
Yet there he is on that $20 bill wearing a cloak. He was a good president in my opinion, but he was a greater general. But he's still wearing civilian clothing. And then on the $50 bill, you have Ulysses S. Grant, who nobody can argue that he was a better president than he was a general. Outside of Lincoln, Grant saved the Union in the Civil War. But yet on that $50 bill, you see Grant dressed as a civilian. Whether it is Lincoln, excuse me, whether it is Grant, Jackson, or Washington, or if you say take it from 20th century his, history, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, George Marshall, there has been a long and extraordinarily important uh, practice. Uh, yes, Caleb, that's exactly what I'm saying. But the thing is, is that uh, what they uh, what they do would do in America in the United States was is that there is a long practice in the United States of what's called civilian control of the military, that the military basically stays out of politics. Do generals become presidents in the United States? Yeah, I just mentioned a handful of them. Uh, plus plenty of others in the 19th century, let alone Dwight Eisenhower in the 20th. But the thing is, is that all of those men resign their commission and get out, uh, they resign out of the army before they run for president or become a senator or, or this or that. That was not the case in Mexico. Oftentimes you will see men maintain their commission as a general in the Mexican army and at the same time, also maintain uh, or gain offices, whether it's governor of the state of Mexico, which is like saying the District of Columbia to us, or being a governor of uh, the district, uh, the state around Veracruz, or on and on I can go. They will hold multiple offices while they're holding their position. It's, it's a, a very, very uh, nasty situation. And these guys are active. They are politically active. Uh, there is no such thing as civilian control of the military in that sense, like the United States has. Uh, and the problem goes further still. The first head of state of Mexico uh, is a guy named Augustin de Iturbide, or Emperor Iturbide. Now, he lasts all of about five days, I mean, truthfully, 10 months. But uh, Iturbide, who was a general, there's your first problem right there, is going to re be replaced uh, in a few months after he's deposed and eventually executed. Uh, he's going to be replaced by a man named Guadalupe Victoria, the namesake of Victoria, Texas and Victoria County. Guadalupe Victoria is the first president of the Republic of Mexico. And Victoria is a good guy. I, I have no complaints about him as an as a officer or more particularly as a president. He's, he's a good man, I think. He's, but he's not George Washington. But no, there's only one Washington, I guess you could say. But uh, anyways, all that to say is, though, is you'll find these Mexican generals all over the place uh, beset by corruption, uh, whether they're taking kickbacks uh, or buying, is the question that's been asked. Are they buying bad gunpowder to get kickbacks? Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. Or they're allowing the sale of good gun, excuse me, cheap gunpowder that they say is fine, but it's really not the, uh, and they know it, they're getting their pockets lined. And then you see them also being active in politics and all over the place. Uh, in fact, actually, if you wanted to do it this way, if I were you, I would do it right now. If you would uh, pull up the, uh, let me do this. I'm going to put myself on pause for just a second. Before I hit the pause button, uh, I'm going to say it like this for the camera. Look up in Wikipedia the list of the heads of state of Mexico. Now I'm going to hit the pause button. 